darkly splendid abodes, the official podcast of Toronto Thelema, exploring, if you will, practical philosophy, from science and the workings of the mind to spirituality, esotericism, and magic. Stooping down, dipping my wings, I came unto the darkly splendid abodes. There is division hither homeward. With planetary crises popping up almost monthly, I have a picture in my head of Iwas standing in the corner of the room with a smirk that says, I told you so. Let's explore how we can cope with and confront these changing times from a Thelemic perspective. Edward Mason joins me once again. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Well, I mean, we we set up this particular podcast to look at the idea that we are in an enormous planetary crisis right now, and there's a deep sense of anxiety, alternating with periods of horror and periods of, well, maybe it'll be okay for a while we're all sort of caught in that combination of responses to what's happening around us in terms of climate change generally, political decay among the democracies, even if they have all rallied to support Ukraine for the moment, and things such as the current shortage of certain foodstuffs and other manufactured goods, All these things produce this sense of us being in a critical time. And the thought that came to me when I was um, considering this podcast was, well, the book of the law was given to us as a warning that, you know, as Horace says in the book, I have crushed an universe and naught remains. The, The entire underpinnings of a cultural paradigm that had spread around the world Uh, they were just being washed away. And we saw that pretty rapidly when World War I broke out. But also just the sheer pace of technological change, even in the early 1900s, as people became more mobile, telephones became more ubiquitous. After World War I, there was some radio service for the public, every day, if not 24 hours a day, and so on and so on. The snowball has been rolling down the hill to become the avalanche we're in right now. And the book is very much about, look, you need to be braced to deal with this, um, to recognize that there is a continuum, which is the first chapter, the one about Nuit. You have to find that which you are and what you need to do and to live that to the hilt That's the second chapter, that of Hadith. And the consequences are this extraordinary third chapter, which Crowley admitted toward the end of his life, he still didn't fully understand because it's got some direct physical predictions. I I am a god of war and of vengeance. I will deal hardly with them. Um, Combined with a lot of deeper symbolic content about the changing state of consciousness that's going to emerge out of the crisis. So Thelema is kind of like, you know, this is, this is boot camp. <laughs> You're going to have to uh, start here and figure out how you, as an individual, as a separate monad in this vast cosmos, are going to handle your own situation. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's <laughs> the funny thing about it is that uh, people tend to think of Thelema as being kind of, well, I mean, any spiritual path is making things easier. And mm. time and again, we've, I know we've discussed uh, just the fact that that's not the case. There's a, there is trouble hither homeward, so to speak. Division. Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Thelema is no fun On a superficial level, I think there's a deep sense of joy throughout Thelema, precisely because it doesn't evade the crunchy stuff. Thelema, more than anything else around in our time, is able to look at the darkness. Christianity did 
medieval Christianity was astonishingly fixated on plague, famine, death. You know, you see that in medieval paintings. It was just a given. Um, you know, Hieronymus Bosch was not a surrealist. He was just painting how people saw life with that extraordinary uh, Garden of Earthly Delights painting. Um, Thelema is the one thing we have that really gives us a spiritual perspective while refusing to avoid looking at just how tense, how threatening, how darkly transforming current events are going to prove. So yeah, this is the thing you need if you're going to make it through with your psyche more or less intact. I guess it's the the, the problem being that uh, it's difficult when you're in it to, uh, like you get caught up in the the terrible moments and uh, it's difficult to extract yourself and say existence is pure joy from that perspective, of course. And it might seem yeah, completely hey. the opposite. Mostly it is the opposite. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say, hey, I just look at this and think, oh, well, it's going to happen. It's all going to be fine. No, I get scared. I get depressed. I get worried. I find I don't have answers for people who look at me and say things are bad, aren't they? Um, because obviously the answer you can give to any one person depends where that person's at. You can't just say, well, yes, there's going to be total cultural destruction of what we have right now, but those of us who have learned to live entirely in accordance with our true wills will be the survivors, and um, death is a fiction anyway. It, that doesn't necessarily meet the criteria of the, the situation most of the time. But at the same time, if you, Thelema is not a philosophy. It's a praxis. It's something you do, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law on all levels, not just the fact that you have some sort of bunch of spiritual or metaphysical ideas, but that you ha do certain practices that <clears throat> give you the ability to at least temporarily withdraw into a place, a state, a zone of consciousness where stuff falls into a different perspective, where there is that eternal silence from which I think the um, existence that is pure joy, know ye that existence is pure joy is the actual line, where that emerges from, the deep silence you, you can find through meditation, through diligent ritual work, through continued esoteric study, study in the sense not just of reading stuff by Crowley and other people, but also contemplating the ideas coming up and looking at how you as an individual fit into this increasingly crazy world. But you do have to realize that you're always going to feel a little bit flaky, a little bit on the outside, and yeah, a little bit sad. There's only so much one individual can do, and trying to do more than you can do is one of the biggest problems that activists run into. They want to save the world, but they can't actually do very much on a local issue because they never want to get their hands messy with the slow procedural and legal stuff that needs to be done to make effective changes. Yeah, I guess a, a part of the uh, difficulty might be uh, you get caught up in the energies of things versus you step back and observe what's going on. And that's kind of a philosophical and, you know, like a very Buddhist kind of perspective to things, being able to recognize that existence is uh, sorrow and then being able to step back from that and observe that gives you some kind of separation from it. Yeah, I think um, the way I've always explained it to myself and to other people is the line is existent. Know ye that existence is pure joy. Existing is often a very frustrating, disappointing, and saddening thing. The, the actual events of the outer world, what in the four worlds of the Kabbalah eh, we call Asiya, manifestation, it's often just a mess. <laughs> Little more than that, it's a disappointing chaos, um, which is always where I clash with uh, conspiracy theorists because I think you're just not looking at how nuts everything is. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, if only George Soros and the Illuminati were running everything, 
it'd be fine but and could run it in a smooth and <laughs> controlled yeah. fashion instead of chaotic exactly. you could set up a, you know an administrative pyramidal structure and just uh, keep everything on track but george soros is 91 now and um no no one's doing that we are in the middle of a disordered and scary situation the effective thing to do first of all is to find something authentic within yourself not you know something that you visualize that you like i don't mean a happy place i mean finding that point where you start realizing that there is within you a pulse a kind of voice a rhythm a plane a level of consciousness whatever phrase begins to make sense to you that is outside of the chaos and it will endure past the chaos i suppose there are enlightened masters walking around on the planet who can live in that kind of condition more or less all of the time um i've never met anyone that i would say i would put quite in that category but i do meet people in thelema who've spent a lot of years really working on this and can respond to the upheavals of life without forgetting that they've discovered that place of silence that place of stillness you know with thelema there is a beyond philosophy there's a praxis of finding that which is the essential underlying underpinning state of selfhood that is not just a state in fact it's a bad word to use it's a dynamic energy and i think this is where selima truly parts paths with buddhist perspectives because buddhists are tending to find that a state we realize that the universe is incredibly dynamic um some of the the zogchen and vajrayana practitioners in tibetan buddhism understand this but a lot of people don't and it gets to be upsetting because <clears throat> there isn't anything you can rest on unless you are being relatively dynamic in life situations um i find this particularly complicated now i'm trying to be a retired person <laughs> and i'm supposed to be just you know kicking back and that isn't working out <laughs> yeah i think that's it it does reveal the fact that there's a natural tendency for us to think in terms of nouns like think of i uh, i think of myself as um such and such a person i mean just the the idea of describing yourself by what you do for a living yes. is um i mean it sounds like an act but it's actually trying to reduce it to a noun and uh simplify it yeah um definitely thelema is verbs not nouns I think there's a point in the whole process weld along the path where the difference becomes moot and when you really really you know get into that groove that that space that you're hunting for with magic and meditation the idea of a being there being much of a difference between a an open state a relaxed state of mind and a dynamic state of mind rather tends to dissolve but we do have to draw a philosophy from our experience and the philosophy is very much centered on the verbs do and love love not in the sense of some something you could write a poetry about but something that isn't it's necessary to do love is the law law compels rather than requiring you just to look with uh, gooey eyes at people it requires you to recognize the totality of the universe and embrace all of that including the specifics of the the individuals that you run into day to day it makes me think that uh, um it also involves um how i was suggesting the idea of like stepping back and separating yourself in order to understand the circumstances you're in versus being embroiled in them um i feel like one or other of those two positions is not necessarily right just alone instead it's kind of oscillating between the two of them and allowing yes, yourself to become embroiled very much and i think again that 
kind of relates to the first two chapters of the book of the law. Nuit is you know, the universe and your own universe, while you will be aware of the th fact that there are galaxies and black holes and all kinds of stuff out there beyond the earth, your own personal universe is a much more compressed type of thing. But within that universe, you have autonomy. I think the, f the fear we run into is we don't know how to act. We feel unsure what to do. Whereas if you begin to train your consciousness to look for that silence, that in a, in a center that is not a center, a uh, center that's everywhere, a circumference that's nowhere, then you begin to find the, the dynamism that you're after. You don't have to make giant steps. But we get caught up with the fact that we look at things like climate change, which is so massive, um, and the extraordinary sort of sleepy apathy with which it's met on the political level. Yeah, well, that's a bit too much for anyone to address, and certainly not at this electoral cycle. And besides, I'd be voted out if I, you know, destroyed somebody's job. So we'll kick that down the road, and we'll agree to a set of um, emission standards for 2030 or 2040 or something, but not now. Um, you can make the change you need in your own life, which might have nothing to do with changing the the process of social and environmental decay at all. Um, you can find that your own path through this. And I think that is where we need to put ourselves first of all. If there is something bigger that we find we can do, that's great. But a lot of your confidence comes from feeling that your own life is a contribution to the world and therefore to yourself. Because if you're not making a contribution, you feel kind of weird about being alive. Um, I mean, that's depression. <laughs> not knowing what your worth is and feeling that the world doesn't need you. The moment you feel you're making some kind of contribution on whatever level, um, depressed and anxious states tend to lift. That's what the book of the law is telling us. Like, do something. Now, do you feel like there's a, a sense um, that there's more, more of a few, feeling of futility or lack of purpose nowadays? I mean, I don't know if it's it. There's probably been a level of that throughout history at any given time, I'm sure. But uh, I think people alive right now, as people in any epoch, uh, are probably thinking that um, right now it may feel particularly like you know, that sense of futility and lack of purpose. It's very intense right now. <clears throat> and we are, I hate dumping on media because media are desperate to survive. They're not trying necessarily to subvert us at all, but they do know that they are going to survive better if we read what they put out. So there is this constant barrage of headlines of content of quotes from people that make us feel helpless in the face of what's going on. I also tend to wonder the, how to put this. As a boomer, I came up through this period after World War II, where I was never required to go and fight in a war. Um, there was this possibility of world peace always hanging around at least until the last 20 years. There was really that feeling through the last few decades of the 20th century that we might be able to navigate our way through. And then suddenly things fell apart again. They were already falling apart, but that's what we saw. On the other hand, people throughout history have been used to an extraordinary level, maybe not of warfare, depending where you were, but warfare was a very common fact of life in most places. Uh, disease, plagues were an enormous thing. They were expected. You know, when you look at the average lifespan of people, it was so low because you could easily be knocked out by some terrible disease in your 40s, whereas these days you'd rush to a hospital and they'd say, well, we can you know, shoot you full of some drugs and this should get you through. 
So we have this comparison in our minds between what was promised. And even if you weren't really conscious in the late 20th century, like the boomers and the Gen X people, you're still hearing us tell you the story of how wonderful, in quotes, it was before. So you have this sense of loss and lack of direction. And we don't really have that sense of identification with the historic reality, which was, you know, if war doesn't come this year, then we can have a good harvest. Hmm. But often war was part of the, the political processes that people uh, had to live under. So we're, we're in this funny time when we don't quite know what our time is supposed to be like, but it feels like it's not being what we wish that it was. Uh, the, yeah, it feels like that. I mean, I, I was a teenager in the 90s, and that was comparable in the sense that uh, there was just this feeling of being insulated, um, and especially living in southern Ontario. Um, it, it's just kind of like sheltered from the whatever might be going wrong in the world outside. It just felt like, okay, you know, there were wars in the past, as you say, and, and like uh, now things are cool. There's the chance of peace. And it felt like, okay, well, you know, that's all in the past, that kind of thing. And then 9-11 was the big, you know, kick in the pants for that, that sent shockwaves. Yes. Uh, and kind of destroyed that apparent peace and, you know, the, the sense that we were safe and sheltered and that sort of thing. Yes, that was the, the big thing that broke out 9-11 and everything that's, that spilled out from that, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the sense of a broken world order. I think there were a lot of historical factors already in place that made it far worse um, the unwisdom of the political leaders we've had in the Western countries anyway is quite stunning. Maybe this is part of the falling away and the falling apart that we have to go through. Um, I don't think it's fatalism to say that this is unavoidable. I think it's just we are, you know, the, the, the river is washing away the, the marks, the, the street signs. And that is a necessary but upsetting, scary change in, in history. We're moving into an entirely new kind of history. Um, what's it going to be like? <laughs> Will we have countries in the old way? Because the entire global political order is up in the air right now, and nobody is doing really well. China's in lots of economic problems. The states is divided. Russia got itself in a slight mess in Eastern Europe and so on and so on. That There is no shining beacon on the hill here. You only find the beacon within yourself when you have actually decided to make that commitment to, to seek a dynamic truth within yourself. I think there, I'm, I'm sort of sensing um, some, some people catching on to the fact that like, if you can focus at the local level rather than getting too caught up at the uh, global level. Um, there are changes you can make. There are differences that you can make. Definitely. And again, I'd say you have to start with the personal. Thelema does not see this as mere selfishness. This is commitment to the divine spark that is our lives you're not going to find that divine spark by being focused on everything but your own existential fact. I'm here in this time. I have power within me, but I need to learn to nurture that. I need to learn to discover it. I need to learn to express it in the ways that I can do effectively. Yeah, maybe Greta Thunberg had some effect on the public debate. I don't know, but a lot more needs to be done by people on the, the local levels and saying, look, this particular situation needs to be fixed. Um, and you can do that far more effectively when you have the confidence of a sense that you are right with yourself, that you know that there is something more than merely human operating within you and 
if you fail, that's okay. This is not, particularly in North America, we're so success oriented, we're terrified of failure. Um, there's an awful lot of failure going to happen before we gradually carve out a new social structure, a new way of relating to our planet and each other. And obviously from Thelema, there has to be a new spiritual paradigm, which is there, it's forming, it's developing, but it's still overlain by an awful lot of stuff that has to be cleared away before it can have a uh, crystal clear manifestation. That is a really powerful thought too. Like that's something that I've uh, definitely experienced myself as pivotal throughout adulthood, um, encountering the fact that, yeah, failure is okay. There's that sense initially when you're going through that kind of thing that you're, it's going to be the end of the world and, you know, it's going to be a cutoff point uh, to the future. But when you go through it and the sun comes up again the next day um, and it just keeps moving on, you just, you, you learn to pick up and move on and, and that it's not the end. You do. Um, and learning to live with that rhythm, I think, is part of this whole process of discovery of the true will. It's not like some nice, clear track where you can see exactly where you're going. Most of the time, you're blundering through the jungle. Um, the key is to keep on going, to keep on blundering if necessary, until you find the trail. Um, I did this with somebody here where I live in Mexico. There's, there's a lot of wooded areas here. We had agreed to make a walk and she got very scared when we were two miles from anywhere. And I thought, well, we're going to have to blunder somewhere. <laughs> or else, <laughs> what if we're stuck here overnight? And I thought, well, let's not. <laughs> um, I realized I just, because since I, since I was always a very shy and intimidated person, I'd, I'd learned from Thelemic work and Thelemic collective experience, it's okay, you can go ahead and go where you need to go and just trust that you're going to put yourself where you have to be. And sure enough, half an hour later, we, you know, it was quite a long hike through the woods, but we came to the wall of a huge agricultural establishment. And I said, well, we're obviously back in civilization. And I think that is what happens spiritually with us. We go into these states and phases and often long periods of not knowing where we are. But if you keep on keeping on, then you find eventually that you have simply created something by your sheer persistence that is going to get you through and get you moving onward again. That makes a lot of sense. I hope it does. <laughs> well, certainly when we were stuck in the woods, I, mean, I, I had to be the confidence for both of us because she was getting very panicky. She's a lady who's prone to uh, occasional panic attacks and uh, apparently being lost was one of her big fears. Mm -hmm. So that was... Um, well, you know, I mean, being lost is something that uh, we all go through when we're confronting this whole idea of the the w true will and whatnot, because, um, again, going back to the idea of like trying to define it as a noun, like saying my true will is to be, um, X job. Um, uh, it's like my true will is to be a soldier or my true will is to be, a, you know, working in this field that that again you can have failures there and then what does that mean does that mean that your true will was wrong or you've lost touch with it or you're not living up to it but it's that's not true it's like that's part of your process is going through this uh, uh change and there's so much that you end up learning by that kind of disruption and you get closer to a deeper understanding of your actual true will which is not just simply existing in one state as a noun Definitely. I mean, 95% of what we do in our lives is not essentially relevant to um, what it is we're here to explore. As we've come into incarnation, we have things we need to learn. And we do all of this blundering around and so-called failure in order to have the experiences that push us in the, the right direction at the end of the day.
Well, um, it was really nice talking about this. And yet again, I feel like it's a subject that uh, um, could lead down any number of other rabbit holes. But thanks very much for joining me again. And uh, we'll have to do this, uh, maybe pick up on some of the subject of free will again. Right, let's do that. Or true will. Free will actually is a different thing, but that would also be incredibly interesting to talk about. That's a debate of it on it all on its own. Mm-hmm. Free, will, free will and true will, yeah. Well, thanks again for joining okay. me. 93. Thank you. 93. Love is the law. Love under will. Look for Toronto Philema on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Watch for events in the city and join us again in the darkly splendid abodes. Mm-hmm.